Hey all, I hope everything is going well with you um, and that you're ready and super tuned in to what I really think is one of the most important lessons of anyone who is going to educate others in a movement setting. And I always say that if you do nothing at all, do these three things and um, you will be serving the greater good of your population. The lesson today is called the criteria for a learning experience. And so what it equips you with is the knowledge and information that you're going to need when you go into a movement setting to modify, um, to select activities that you're gonna bring in and then to modify them if needed so that they provide your students with the best possible learning experience or your athletes with the best learning experience, your participants. And so there are three criteria for those um, decisions that you'll be making. Uh, and so it is extremely important that you understand them and kind of understand the, really the sliding scale and the sliding nature of those. Oops. So let me. <clears throat> So like I mentioned before, this is the criteria for learning experience. There are three. Um, in physical education, there's actually a fourth, but we'll talk about those in other classes. But the three primary big things are um, what we're going to present and talk about today. So the first criteria, and it always seems silly to me, but when you think about its application to real life situations, and then you go, huh, yeah, why do we do that? So in this case, the LE is learning experience. So the learning experience must have the pot potential to improve motor performance or skills of the students in some way, shape or form. It must include, it must improve performance. So basically what it's saying, and it sounds silly, but this is really something that we needed particularly in the field of physical education. Um, basically, if you're gonna do something, you might as well teach something. I say it all the time in physical education. I say, we don't do anything without the focus on learning, nothing. So, you know, when we pay, play dodgeball, are we really, which I, if I had you all raise your hand, if you were in front of me, most of you have played, if not everybody. But what is the point of dodgeball? What are we learning in dodgeball? And, and unfortunately, um, it, it can be done well. And the unfortunate part is that it's not done well. And that's why in some states, it's actually illegal to play dodgeball, which is funny. Uh, so, Basically, if you think about, well, what are we teaching in, in those cases? You know, what are, when we were in elementary school, we did heads up, seven up. What were we teaching? You know, duck, duck, goose. What does that teach? Those types of things where, you know, if you're really, you really can't look at something and go, yeah, that is going to be the goal of this lesson or this practice or this you know, workout session. What is that goal going to be? So don't do anything unless there's improvement in something, improvement in performance, improvement in skills, improvement in strength. You know, it's one of those things where why do it if it's not going to teach something? But many, many times students will be, you'll look at something and go, why are we doing this? Like, you know, in PE doing re relays, like there's a relay called over under relay. And I just actually saw it a couple months ago. And, and what it is, is that you take a ball and you're in lines of four or whatever, and you go, you pass the ball over to the person who's behind you. And that person kind of catches it and then uh, kind of hikes it if you will, to between their legs to the person behind them who then receives it and goes over, get it, and then under. That's an over under relay. Sometimes we do that in PE. Um, again, what, if you look at something, you go, what is that teaching? And if the answer is nothing, or if the answer is, well, it could be that, I mean, it could be a hike, really. No one would ever use that activity to teach a football uh, center how to do that skill. Um, but if, if it isn't teaching anything, then don't do it. Do it in recess, do it at birthday parties, play duck, duck, goose, duck, duck, goose, all you want in your birthday parties. Although I will have to, to, to mention that when I've seen it played at duck, duck, or at birthday parties, like for four-year-olds and whatnot, uh, it's not fun. People cry because basically there's one winner and a bunch of losers. And yeah, that's the real world. But do you really want to teach that a fourth grade or four-year-old birthday party? So just kind of be aware of what those types of things do. And if they aren't focusing on positivity and having fun, and then of course, learning a skill, then they're not something that you're going to want to bring into the setting. And sometimes you lose, you lose, you know, you can't throw a fit, but um, you know, if we set up the activities so that most people are losers, eh, is it really an educational environment? 
Okay, the next one. This one is perhaps the most important of all the importance. So these three are the most important thing. This is the most important thing. And this is a biggie for everyone in this class, practically 99% of you, this is huge. If you are not, the learning environment must provide maximum activity or maximum practice time for the learner, the student, the participant, whatever it is. So it's that same kind of motive that if you aren't actively engaged, you cannot learn. And for those of us in sport and those of us who are in the physical activity realm, this, this, some, this is something that we know, but we don't implement correctly. And that's really important. We know that it takes, I mean, in skill uh, research wise, it takes 150 hours to become proficient at a skill, a particular skill. So, and that's a lot of time and a lot, we don't have that time in PE certainly. And, and a lot of times we don't have that in a season for, for athletes. And so we kind of have to do long range plans for those things, which is what we do. But what we don't, what we end up doing, hold on, pause. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mom life. And uh, I'm in the middle of, um, watching my dog carry a piece of um, furniture, a furniture cushion across the backyard. So that's awesome. <laughs> uh, even my son is in the other room laughing. So where was I? Okay, most important criteria of all for practically everyone involved in listening to this is that maximum activity piece. So uh, and for coaches, I feel like this is the hardest for you to kind of figure out. Um, for teachers, there's so many opportunities and so many resources for us to bring in so many different things in the classroom that, that maximum participation should not be a problem. Basically, the rule is that if you're going to do something, participants should be active at least 50% of the time. And that's actually, if you think about it, you're going to do something for 50% of the time. So uh, if you have 20 minutes of activity, then you're doing 10 minutes of, you have time on task. If you're going to learn how to dribble, you need a basketball. Um, and so this, that's a perfect example. Dribbling is usually kind of the perfect example for lots of things. But if you're going to learn how to dribble, I need to give you a ball. Makes sense, right? So if you're going, to, I'm going to teach you how to dribble. So I meet criteria number one. I'm going to give you a ball so that you have to have maximum participation. So here's where this works, where people go, huh, I get this now. If you're in a line, which we do in relays, which we shouldn't do, or you're lining up to, you know, take a field of ground or, uh, you know, you're, you've got people at different positions and there's like five or six or seven people behind you and they're waiting their turn, um, that is not maximum participation. And so you might think to yourself, well, how am I going to do that? I'm one coach and 18 kids, um, or hopefully you don't have that many, but 18 kids, how am I going to do that? You have to become creative. You have to get assistant coaches to help, you know, put several lines, put the middle infield here, and then the people on the outer infields and then have pop flies. And then there's people in small groups participating. So they get more opportunities to respond. So we call that OT, OTR, opportunities to respond. Um, we also call it OTP, which is why I had a little moment of, hmm, what was that? Uh, opportunities to perform. So uh, this one is the most important thing. I spend the majority of my life trying to figure out how I'm going to give people the maximum opportunities to participate, to practice, to respond, to perform, whatever it is, my whole life. So if I'm going to teach gymnastics, how am I going to get everybody involved in a forward role? How am I going to set up the classroom so that people are, the majority of the people, 50% or more, are active 50% or more of the time. So not only if I have a 20 minute you know, lesson or an hour practice, not only do you want them actively engaged for 50% of the time, which again, the, the higher you get, the better it is for your learner, your participant, but you also within the activity, and that's a big deal. So this is kind of a twofold maximum participation thing. Not only do you want them to do the most amount of time ever, if you're given an hour, you want them to be participating as much as possible. Um, if you are in, within the activity is just as important. So say that you're doing, you know, say you are hitting grounders and you say, oh, well, I did worked on grounders for a half hour today, but your lines had 10 people in them. So one performer at a time for 30 minutes is only 10%. One performer out of 10 is only 10% activity time because nine times when they're waiting in line, 90% of the time that you were in activity, they were waiting. That is huge. 
I can't express that enough. Even if you were in lines of four, you got to hope we uh, relays. We love relays and they're not appropriate. We'll talk about more when we talk about appropriate practices. There are ways to do things that are relay based. Um, and it isn't because I, you know, I float around. I want everyone to be gentle and tags lightly and I want everyone to win. And there's going to be winners. There's going to be losers. People are going to fall. People are going to cry. You know, we are going to have to teach people how to deal with those things, especially in physical education appropriately. Um, but there's also a place for us to kind of put that, especially in education, so that the main goal is to learn and to become healthy, active movers and not to win. And again, in sport, I get it. I know what we're, we're going with. So if you've got people all lined up in, in fours, even that is 25%. So there's, there, we have to constantly, consistently work to find things, develop things and modify things that give us maximum participation all the time. You know, if you've got, you want to teach dribbling and you've got a group of 20 kids, give, hopefully you have 20 basketballs, give them all basketball so that they all can dribble and you can, everyone's dribbling at the same time, hundred percent participation. Can't get better than that. Um, and there's lots of ways to modify and tweak whatever it is. And what these criteria for a learning experience are these, these last six minutes are probably the most important minutes of this whole thing. But what the criteria for learning experience gives you are the tools to look at something or maybe pull something off the internet, um, which there's unlimited amounts of things, also unlimited amounts of inappropriate things. And so these give you the tools to look, pull things off, you know, see what someone's doing in practice, see what someone's doing at a gym and go, okay, how can I use these criteria to modify it and make it more appropriate for my learners, for my specific learners? And you're going to have a spectrum going to have the kids who are skillful and the kids who aren't skillful, the kids who are fit and the kids who aren't fit, the really good athletes and the kids who were on the bench. You know, where, how are you going to provide maximum participation for them? And then we'll talk about number three is kind of that level of high skilled and low skilled. And so it gives you the tools. So you look at something, pull it offline. What does this teach? If it's just fun, then do it at recess. Do it on a fun day, Friday after, you know, a, or, or fun day, Monday after a tournament when you won and you want to give them, you know, do it when it's not your, at the time for your students, your athletes, your, to learn, to be actively engaged. Do it at a time that it, it works for that. But other than that, use your time wisely. Pick good activities with high involvement that teach something all of the time. If you have, you know, you're going to teach four roles. I used gymnastics earlier. Don't line everybody up and get them on one little mat and have them roll, wait, roll, wait, roll, wait. Give everybody mats, get yoga mats, put yoga mats on top of each other. Kids will roll on the grass. They do it all the time. They'll be fine. Um, all sorts of things like that where people are rolling all of the time, cartwheeling all of the time, whatever the skill is. <clears throat> so you need to have equipment. You need to have opportunities to respond and you need to use your time wisely. So make decisions accordingly. I mentioned something about the internet and how many, how that's where we kind of, that's our go-to. We go to the YouTube, we go to the, you know, anything, Google, YouTube, uh, you know, there's PE Central for us. There's openphysed.org, um, pecentral.org. And then there's a couple other PE ones that we kind of go to, but they're really good for activities. So those of you who are coaching, if you wanted to go and get some batting activities, strike, they call them striking in these, because that's the skill of striking. Um, throwing and catching, you just, you can kind of Google throwing and catching. And then if you get into PE websites, there's amazing activities. I mean, PE teachers, that's all we do. And so we just think of different ways to, number one, entertain kids, number two, involve kids, and number three, educate kids, which is of course, you know, any level of, of skillfulness that you're trying to teach is that captures you. But basic, but, but the problem with that is that everyone and their brother literally thinks that they can write a PE book or run a PE website or post a, a fun activity that their kids had fun in the, at a party in the backyard or something. And then people who don't understand the concept of education and teaching something and giving people opportunities to respond will be like, this is so great. I'm going to bring it into my class. And we call those uh, activities PE Hall of Shame activities, but they certainly work for everything. And those are the types of things where you just, you're having fun. There's no real learning. The performance of a skill doesn't look like a skill that's beneficial when it's kind of implemented in where it belongs. So there's a game that's called Mess in My Yard. It's ridiculous. And I see it in PE all the time. 
And it's really where the PE teacher throws out all the PE equipment all over the gym. And you kind of divide the, the gym space up like, like dodgeball. You just use the center court line. One side, you know, is against another side. And on go, all you do is you get all of the mess from your yard to the next yard. And you'll see kids like throwing and hucking and kicking and, you know, all sorts of craziness. And there's no actual real throwing. So there's no learning there. There's no practice or participation in a skill that is beneficial. So when you look at number one, why are we doing that? You know, it doesn't teach a skill. So it's just something that should go in that kind of the hall of shame, if you will, of our activities. And if there's a way that you can modify it, sure, you, you can try, but that's, this is your, these are your tools. So if you get mess in my yard off of the internet, look and see, does it have the, what is it teaching? Does it teach something? That's number one. Does it teach something? And that's improved motor performance or skill. Does it do that? And if it does, is there maximum participation? And so there's lots of ways to kind of modify that. So if you think about other ways to modify maximum participation, if like a five on five basketball game, now I'm thinking about, and, and you know, obviously in practice, you're going to need to work five on five for many, many, many things. But if you're going to work on, if you're going to try to in, teach something like a, a pick and roll or let's do a, yeah, a screen and roll. If you're going to teach a screen and roll um, and you want them to really work on that, having kids of 10 with one ball, having groups of 10, five on five with one ball is not the opportunity for that. It's not the best opportunity. So you'll teach it. Obviously you'll break it down into small parts. You'll have maybe one to two people kind of running it. And then you put in the defense, that third person is defense who the person's going to screen. And then maybe we'll put that second person in. So that's two V two. Um, but really a three V three is the answer to all kids love it. It's a ton of activity. It is, um, there's nowhere to hide. So you know that students are going to be participating in it and it spreads open the amount of space so that there's less people there. So that if you're just learning how to do something like that, um, you're, you're learning how to screen, you're learning which way to roll, you're learning how to pat all those different, how to seal off people. Um, the opportunity for three on three is, increases the, the opportunity for those students to respond and learn it much better. So it's usually kind of two ways that you incre increase activity. I'm spending the most time on it because it's the most important. Two ways that you can increase activity, either reduce the number of people or increase the amount of equipment. Kind of, they both go hand in hand. So think of all the things that you do in your life um, if you're doing something that you know, you're wanting people to do a lot of reps, you know, particularly in the health and fitness industry, and clearly you don't want people standing around and waiting. I mean, you don't see that too often, but sometimes you do. Sometimes it's required. You want to really blast some muscle group and then give them a rest period while someone else performs. That's just good planning for whatever you're going to be using. Um, but the majority of the time, if we want people to learn and be engaged, then they need to learn and be engaged. So make really good decisions based on how that's going to go. Um, so look at something and go, huh, what does this teach? And if it's nothing, see if you can change it. But typically for the, like you can't make heads up, seven up, good. Um, if you don't know what that is, then you're probably lucky, but it was fun when we were kids. If uh, duck, duck, goose, eh, you're sitting, what are you learning? You, you know, you usually you just think of that game of, of the kids who touch the, the, you know, the wrong kids because they're slow or they're friends and kids are left out. No one's participating. You're not learning anything. Can't make that good. But if there's something that you're looking at something, you go, okay. There's 12 kids and one ball. You know, how can I make, if I make it five kids and one ball, is it still gonna have the same kind of structure? Will they still be able to do? Can I do it with three kids? You know, what is going to still kind of have the kids interest? Cause that's always important. Teach them an activity and give them max participation. And if the answer is you can't do it, then don't do that activity. That's, that's how these work. <clears throat> Easy peasy. The last piece is important and you really have to be tuned in. They're all important. I can't say enough that this is the most important lecture that anyone in the movement setting will receive. I, I, I wish there was a way to assess this everywhere I go so I could really check in with you and help you utilize these in your different fields. And so just make sure um, that you are thinking about how that addresses you, even if I'm not giving examples from your field. So the last one is called um, the appropriate developmental level. And so the learning environment must be at an appropriate developmental level. Super important. And I talked about earlier that the spectrum of people that you're going to have in your populations. I mean, if you're really lucky, you have super high skillful people, but when does that happen in our life? Especially if we're sports, you're really lucky if you get the super high skillful people. Um, and, and, and basically there's always a spectrum. In PE, there's a 
giant spectrum, probably the hugest spectrum that exists besides the health and fitness realm. And that's because in PE, even though we have grades, you know, though very seldomly are there grades from K through eight that will hold you back. Um, but typically when you get your group of kids, you have no assurance. If you're a seventh grade teacher, you have no assurance that they've had number one quality PE or PE at all. So the amount of kids that the spectrum that you're going to get are the kids who play after school sports, the kids who play uh, travel ball in one sport are super skillful at one thing, um, or the kids who've never had any PE whatsoever, any activity, no karate, no gymnastics, nothing. And they come to you and here you've got them all. Super skillful travel kids, kids who sit on the sofa and don't do anything. You've got them all. How are you going to educate them? And they are all developmentally different. So it is a challenge and I think perhaps an honor for me, of course, to teach such a wide spectrum, but it's not easy. And I say, there's a saying that PE in particular is um, the easiest job to do horribly. So easy to be a bad PE teacher. That's why I think we see it so much because it's the hardest job, one of the hardest jobs to do well, to, to appropriate, oh, for goodness sakes. Sorry. Here I am back. A little sweatier. I, uh, I moved into a house, a little sidebar, that I completely gutted. This is my new kitchen. I just noticed that this area right here needs to be painted. That's weird. Don't ask me why. I just noticed that. Huh. Yeah, super annoying. The rest of it I just put in, which I'm super excited. And the backyard is a complete disaster. Not that you need to know that, but just sidebar of what's happening this morning. And I have this huge tree being taken out and a stump being grinded today. And so I needed to move all the stuff I have all over the place. And now my dog's in the garage. And the reason that's relevant is because he's going to whine because he can hear my voice. So we, I tried to finish it before all this craziness, but uh, he came an hour early. So here we go. So I am to the very last part. I just need to get these, um, this last bit of important, important information. So the last piece is that developmentally appropriate piece. And I know that I mentioned before that there's a high skilled and low skilled and a spectrum, a literal spectrum in between. Um, and your goal is to make everyone more skillful. You wanna make the more, more skillful kid skillful and the least skillful kids, skillful, more skillful, more able, more fit, more active, more whatever your goal is for your movement setting. And so how you do that is really important. And the decisions that you make based on those abilities is really important. So for example, and perhaps the best example, I'm in, I kind of am in the softball world right now. So I have a 13 um, year old who plays travel softball. She also plays travel basketball and she's just starting to play volleyball. So in the world, <laughs> of travel softball, I see a lot of kids with super expensive bats, super giant bats, super ridiculous bats. And people buy bats based on what they think. Um, that if I buy this big, awesome, expensive ghost bat, um, then I'm going to be able to hit the ball far. But they buy bats that are too long and too heavy. And the reason that's relevant here is that's not, they're not developmentally able to swing that bat. And those of you in baseball, you've probably seen it a lot, or you may not be, pay attention to it. I see there's probably, um, I teach, I coach my son's baseball team. And um, last year, last year I did it for, uh, this year we're still kind of in the COVID part of it all. But last year I had 13 kids and 11 of them, their bats were too heavy and they couldn't, you can't swing around what you cannot lift. And then it changes the plane and they're not able to replicate it. They can't get tired super quickly. Um, and it just doesn't help them do it pro appropriately. There's some super easier, you know, really easy to see. You can't do a cartwheel if you can't take your own weight on your hands. And a lot of kids can't, especially if they're obese at all. So that's a prerequisite skill, the ability to take your own weight on your hands. And that developmentally appropriateness spans to everything. And people in the fitness world, fitness world is getting better at being able to modify activities and change them based on a need, based on the injury, based on a range of motion issue. And so people are getting really great at that developmental appropriate piece. And so that's what you kind of need to think. What is appropriate for the, the way that this person is able to perform, the prerequisite skills that this person has, 
Um, you can't give a person a big old bat if they can't, they don't have the strength to swing it. You can't give them a large tennis racket if they don't have the strength to actually hold it and swing it in the proper planes that you want them to swing it in. Um, can't do a handstand if you can't take your weight on your hands. You can't, excuse me, you can't skip if you don't know how to hop. Step, hop, step, hop, step, hop. So everything kind of has a prerequisite skill to it. You can't play a sport unless you have all the prerequisite skills, which is really important. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the maximum activity. If you put kids in five on five sports at fifth grade, typically you're gonna see the same thing. The kids who are skillful, the kids who play it at recess, the kids who play it after school program, after school programs, travel balls, what, the kids who have those opportunities are gonna run it. They're gonna, they're gonna be constantly having the ball. They're not gonna be passing to everybody that, you know, the kids who aren't skillful but will barely, if ever get the ball, they'll just kind of be running back and forth and probably don't want the ball. They're like, you're fine, we win when you get it. That is not developmentally appropriate for everyone. So you have to change and modify what you do. And sometimes you have to modify the actual rules of the game. Now, for those of you diehard, you know, athletic background, you know, you have your, Basketball has its rules, I get it. Football has its rules, I totally get it. In a setting that you are teaching, there's nothing saying that you can't modify those rules. Absolutely nothing saying that you can't modify those rules. When you are trying to teach someone how to do something. So for example, a volleyball serve. Volleyball is served from 30 feet away from the net. Um, and you know, if you can't get it over the net, then you move on to the next person. Well, if you can't get it over the net and you move on to the next person, that person who can't get it over the net has not learned anything. But what they need to learn and what they can learn and should learn is how to actually do it, where to put the ball, how to toss it, how to hit it, the whole nine yards. And if you move them up, and I'm not saying in a game, although it wouldn't be bad, I'm saying in a practice, move them up to the 10 foot line and let them practice the proper form, get the proper form. And then once they're more, they're stronger at it, they're more successful at it, move them back, move them back, move them back. It can go for anything. It can go for free throws, which is really hard for people to kind of grasp. If you don't have the strength to do it in line, beef, everything's in line, if you know what that means, um, and to be able to shoot it with proper form, then it doesn't make any, it is actually makes worse sense or illogical to have them shoot from the free throw line because they're gonna develop bad habits. And you've seen them, if you've ever seen fifth grade kids or if you've seen a playground, elementary school playground, the kids are out there pretending they're Steph Curry and they're five feet beyond the three foot line and they're using up some crazy body convulsion to huck up every kind of strength and two hand chest pass it up into the sky. And they'll make one out of 20 and it'll be the greatest shot ever. Um, that's not developmentally appropriate. And so for them to move them up to do a set shot, to then do jump shots when they can, um, that is more developmentally appropriate. If you do not have the prerequisite strength to do something, if you do it, you won't get better. You, you know, you won't get better at a three point shot, shooting it, <sighs> hucking it up like this all the time, because it's not what it looks like. So um, that is one of, you've got to make these decisions based on who you have. And it's hard. There's a lot, if you have 10 kids, you can have 10 different levels, which sometimes means 10 different needs. So luckily we can group them. Um, if, for example, when my kids were little, they were like our little Petri dishes. We are, we constantly are trying to kind of research and use them like, what if I do this? Will they be able to do it? What if I do this? What if I say throw over my head? Will they then do proper form? What if I give them a big, light Fred Flintstone bat? Um, what if I lower the basketball hoop? All of those things will make them more successful and make them love it because of that success and want to stay in it more. And really, all of those things help. If you teach someone a skill, give them a ton of time practicing, let it be developmentally appropriate, they will be skillful. And then when they grow with that skill becomes more proficiency, becomes more strength, becomes um, a, a love for participating that will come along with that appropriateness. So if there are ways in your life, if you're in an after school program, this is big. I know that there's a good majority of people always in Kinesis 138 who do after school programs. And um, the, you know, there's lots of capture the flag, lots of large sided, big games because you have a lot of kids and you need to entertain them. But the more kids that you have and the less equipment that you have, the more you will see that they are off task, I promise you. Give them equipment, they will, they will be involved and they will stay doing whatever it is that you want them to do. Um, get, if it's appropriate for them, if, they're, if they have the prerequisite skills, they're gonna be more inclined to be engaged. Um, and so those are the most important things. So remember, 
that these tools are extremely important in all, every avenue that you are teaching in. If you have, if you're in the health and fitness arena, you know, what is developmentally appropriate? How many times, how many reps, how many, how quickly, whatever it is, how many ways can you get them involved in a maximum participation type realm? You know, sometimes things like setting up equipment ahead of time. If you've got 30 minutes, you you know, gyms are great at this. You walk in and you go, oh, medicine balls, oh, Bosu balls. You know, you know what you're going to be in for because equipment is set up ahead of time. They would waste a tremendous amount of time if they you walked in and you're like, okay, pull this out, pull this out. And sometimes it needs to be out because of warmups. But typically the way, everything that can be where it is, like the, the bands are where they're supposed to be ahead of time. So that when you get there, you don't have to spend your participation time it managing or transitioning from one thing to another. So those things are really important. Any, any decisions that you can make ahead of time that will lend itself to more participation is extremely important no matter what you're teaching. So if you're a teacher, you don't just have the equipment in a bag with it tied up. If you're a coach, you don't just have everything in a bag and it's tied up because sometimes that knot is a pain and that means two or three minutes of you know, waiting for you to get everything done. You're trying to use your time the best. So get that equipment out, get it where they, you know, for teachers, get it where they need it first. If they're gonna be in hockey sticks and hockey pucks, line them all up, get them all out there so they don't have to go to one spot and get a stick. Sorry, my dog, hopefully you can't hear him because he's driving me crazy. Um, and so you put the equipment where you want it first so that they can get it and then be instantly active. You want them to come into the gym and do jump ropes, spread the jump ropes out. Those are notorious for getting all tangled up. That's why gyms have such a specific way to put them um, and way to take them off so they don't get tangled. Put them all spread out. Everybody come out in general space, grab a jump rope and begin jumping. And then you press the music. So anything that you can do that increases the amount of activity, decreases any kind of management time where you're managing equipment or transitioning between one thing and another, anything that can do that makes the experience better for the learner because they're more engaged, they're practicing more, they're learning a skill, and that just makes everything better for you, for them, for on-task behaviors, for those of you in those after-school programs or public school programs. Our goal in life is to get them on task. When they're on task, they're less likely to be in trouble or finding ways to get in trouble. So they're super important. The fourth one that I mentioned before, and typically it's a physical education one, but it can be you know, certainly in the fitness realm. It is um, whenever possible, include cognitive, motor, and affective, whenever it's possible. That's the fourth one. It didn't even appear because it's not part of this class yet. It'll be parts elsewhere um, in your programs. So I hope everything is going well with you all. And I hope that you are able to stay sane and the weather's been gorgeous. And so hopefully um, wherever you are, you're enjoying yourself and, and getting out and getting some vitamin D in the sun. I hope everything's going well, family. Talk to you later. Bye.